Hello, this is Justin Joseph Hall, owner of Four Wind Films, and this is Feature and a Short, where filmmakers present, watch, and discuss films. This is a very special episode, episode 20, end of the third season. Elizabeth Yu, Jasmine Simpruch, Thomas Kelsey, and myself will be talking about the best films from the 2010s. I know Elizabeth Yu through the film group The Dissolve, an amazing group of cinephiles. Jasmine, Thomas, and I worked together at Downtown Community Television, a film school and documentary community where we make films. We will present five films for each category. Best Features, Best Shorts, and the Fresh Air Award. From these five films, the other three people rank them from one to five. And film with the best score will move on. From that, we will have four films, one from each one of us. In the final round, uh, we will repeat the process and everybody will rank those four films. And then we will be presenting the Fresh Air Award. And what is the Fresh Air Award, you may ask? Well, this is the movie that pushed the art form of movie making ahead the most during the decade. That is from 2010 to 2019. This is our first Fresh Air Award, so enjoy. We love films, we love watching films, and we love talking about films. That's what we're here to do. Let's just have everybody say their favorite feature and short we've shown on the podcast so far. My personal favorite was from Bruce Lithamane when he came with uh, Postman Blues. And then Lisa Bass's unnamed short from episode two, which was Crohn's disease. Okay, strong opening. Elizabeth Yu. I mean, the feature that I probably like most is Thelma. As far as shorts go, um, I really like Wasp Milan, actually. I think I would probably go with that one. Tom Kelsey. I've been in attendance for many of the feature and shorts that you've hosted. And so I decided to narrow it down to what I actually was in attendance for. And for the short, I actually picked uh, Elizabeth Chatelaine's Sun Dogs, which was the very first episode of Feature and a Short about a mother and a daughter shot in North Dakota. And then for a feature, Dear Zachary, a letter to a son about his father. He appeared in every movie. Jasmine Zimbruch. Yeah, my feature favorite was also Dear Zachary content and just twist. Yeah, and your short? My short is Wasp. Don't see him! Don't see him! Oh. Yeah, I love the storytelling of mother-daughter generational and just like looking at working class individuals. I don't know why I dislike Wasp so much. <gasps> um, Sundogs has the same subject matter, but it does, isn't so, um, I don't know, it's not so unnerving, I guess. Mm. He said, he said during the podcast he doesn't like to see kids in that much distress, and it Aww, stresses him out. Yeah. So. It does, it does. Oh. It's interesting because Thomas is a self-proclaimed... Um, Hater of children? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, great. Let's go straight into the shorts. Jasmine, you start this round. Name your five favorite shorts. Many of mine were actually animated pieces. Um, one was Marcel the Shell... Ooh. <laughs> Dean Fleischer Camp. Oh no, that's not the first one. I think I've even just it. the first one. I, it's just such a unique perspective to view. And I always love being surprised and obviously laughing. Um, of that same vein, Hi Stranger by Kirsten Lepore. Hi Stranger. I... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you might have actually showed that one to me. I think the voice is. So compelling in both Marcel the Shell and in this piece. Um, two very different animations. Too. Two very different animations, yeah. And the animation in High Stranger, there are just so many unexpected elements, and I really appreciate that as well. Do you like this tree I made? Cool, right? Next, Till It's Over. It's a song by Anderson Pack that was directed by Spike Jones and stars um, FK Twigs. It's an Apple um, oh, product thing. promotional video, but ah. she's dancing in it, and there are all these futuristic elements, and the song is just freaking amazing. I love Anderson Pack and obviously Spike Jones. And then finally, Kendrick Lamar's All Right. <laughs> My life I has to fight 
from the content of the song itself to um, the piece, it's all black and white and it revolves around black lives in America. So Elizabeth? One of the shorts that I really, really loved was World of Tomorrow. It's very like existential angst, but also very charming because you've got this little girl doing the voice and the animation so crude, but really fun to look at. So like definitely my most favorite one. I love the animation in it of stick figures. And yeah, from the style of animation to the content of just who we are and what we're going to become and our relationship to ourselves. Um, I really appreciated that. The second was 10 Meter Tower. The filmmakers found a whole group of people who had never jumped off a 10 meter tower into a pool. You see the wide range of reactions. Some of them are very brave. Some of them just can't do it and just run away. Some of them like go in pairs and they're just like, you know, with their friend going like, no, you do it. No, you do it. Right. Like, so like that was really fun to watch. And then Bacon and God's Wrath, which is about, I think, I think this woman was either in her 80s or 90s, but she grew up very, very observant Jew, had never eaten bacon. And she was like, no, I'm gonna do it. And visually, it's like very interesting. Um, My number four, I just watched it. And it's this Greek short called Cassus Belly, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, it's about a queue of people. It starts with a supermarket. You go through like people at like, I think a sort of DMV. Each scenario like gives a glimpse of Greek society in some way. It's very propulsive. And then number five, I don't know if it's sappy, but it was this short called stutterer and i i just like this guy has got such a vivid internal life but like you know he just can't get the words out and it it was a really nice portrait of how somebody finds a way to kind of get through it that's like very ingenious and like really lovely and he gets to connect with somebody else while doing that so like i thought it was really nice so yeah Yeah, i actually had a partner who went through like speech therapy and all of these things because he grew up with a stutter and, yeah. and still struggles with it today. So I admire that film a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the first one I'll mention is called Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. It is a 40 minute documentary about this artist named Mindy Alper in Los Angeles. And she had um, a lot of mental health issues, but the documentary is primarily about how art and her artistic expression was the best way for to fully realize her life and it's really beautiful and i I loved it and also to earn a living which i thought was Mm -hmm. cool i forgot about that Mm -hmm. the second short that i selected is kung fury (laughs) (laughs) this is a short that is made for a particular audience Men that are 16 at heart. (laughs) (laughs) It's on Netflix. And obviously there's a couple jokes that are kind of ran to the ground, but I love those two jokes. So I liked it a lot. Um, The third one is a claymation short called Negative Space. It's only six minutes. It's about a son and uh, his relationship with his father. And it's basically all one build up to one fantastic joke at the end of the short. And I was laughing for... (laughs) many minutes after. Um, It's available on YouTube if you want to check it out. Fourth one I selected is a narrative from Germany called Alles wird gut, or Everything Will Be Okay. It is about a father and the lengths that he'll go in order to maintain his relationship with his daughter. Like what we were talking about before with sun dogs or um, wasp, uh, a child in a difficult situation. But this one, I felt was real grounded in Mm -hmm. its representation and the lengths that the father was going to were understandable and not endangering, Mm -hmm. even though it was a a precarious situation Mm -hmm. for the child. Plus has a very, very specific criteria for children in films. That's true. It's true. And my fifth and final, it's a horror. The title actually sounds like a horror. It's called Lights Out. There's no dialogue in the short, um, but it is a terrifying three minute short that was so popular on the internet that it was turned into then like a 15 million feature 
Mm. And that made so much money that now he's directing, uh, David Sandberg is directing DC um, superhero movies. Kind of just a, an incredible story. All right. Wow. Those are some shorts that I actually forgot about. Quite a few mm-hmm. there. I have totally different ones. The first is called, I have a message for you. The thing is with this film, the, the music and the animation add so much to this incredible true story of a Holocaust survivor that you imagine that you must be feeling the same way that the Holocaust survivor did when this incredible thing happened to her. It is cathartic and, and hopeful, and it's a short film, so you got time for it. The other one is on like the exact opposite scale, and we actually had uh, the director on this podcast. A lot of people do not like this film, but it's called What Up? That is spelled W-A-W-D space A-H-P. And I thought it was one of the most original short films that I had seen in a long time, partially because he combines music video with short film, like a clear narrative, and still manages to like jump to animation in between. Oh my God, I hated this. Oh, yeah. I also watched it yeah. and I was like, oh, there's a lot going on with Justin right now. Yeah. <laughs> it is creative. It's unlike anything I've really seen I, before. The thing that really sold it for me, I think, is when he's when Steve is rapping with his face in the plastic bag and how it's muffled. I think that just it, it really sold the whole short for me. <laughs> the next one is a similarly um, self-indulgent film. It was nominated for an Oscar a few years ago. I wish it would have won. But it's called Parasite and cigarettes it takes the whole 40 minutes for an animated film which like never happens because it's so expensive to do but it's a man honoring one of his seemingly best friends through telling his life story through uh, an amazing comic book uh, animation and then um, the last two are two more documentaries Um, one is the incredibly powerful girl in the river the price of forgiveness it completely sums up how some people live and do not have control over any part of their life and what people will do to take control back. And then the last one is called Extremists. And this is a film about the end of your life and what kind of effects that can have on the family. It's very moving. So those are our 20 picks for best shorts of the year. We can all rate them and then we'll get it down to four and then we'll, as a group, decide on the best short of the 2010s. The first winner on my list, Parasiter and Cigarettes. The top for Jasmine's was World of Tomorrow. For Elizabeth's, The Stutterer was a clear winner. And then for Thomas's, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. I almost put that on my list as well, so I think that is a lovely film. Can you um, name the top four again? Parasiter and Cigarettes. World of Tomorrow, those are the two animation shorts. Stutterer, which is the only live action short. And Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405 is the documentary short that made it. All right, so let us move on to our favorite features created from 2010 to 2019. I am actually very curious to hear Thomas's nominations as I think me and Thomas have kept these lists from each other for a while. So go ahead. I'm going to start with the two that probably have the least uh, positive reaction. So I wanted to choose something um, that was very heavy into blockbuster cinema. It was from 2010. Right off the heels of The Dark Knight is Christopher Nolan's Inception. This is the first time I really remember being wrapped up with an original film that was challenging me uh, in some sort of way. The reason I wanted to see it twice right away is because of the cliffhanger. The big question at the end is, you know, is he asleep? It nearly made a billion dollars worldwide with an original story. So that's number one. Number two is going to get the least positive reaction. <laughs> 2016's La La Land. I knew Thomas would pick La La Land. (laughs) I love musicals, and this touched me in all the right ways. Maybe just other people at this table have just never been in love. Um, I come from an acting background (laughs) and know how to actually dance. (laughs) That's the thing that gets me, Very disappointed in this casting. Well, that did not bother me, obviously. I couldn't, you know, stop watching his eyes. (laughs) Understandable. <laughs> Although I have listened to the music like plenty, like separate from the movie mm-hmm. itself, and I'm like, oh, this is a jolly old time. It's the story, though. I, I mean, the music's fun, but I hated the opening scene. The rest of the movie was great. I, I love the opening scene. 
But I actually frequently watch that ending montage. Oh, yeah. Just that, like, so kind of heartbreaking. Almost anyone can relate in some way. Yeah, I'm being grumpy right now, but, like, you was an okay movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, a Separation from 2011 is uh, about the um, breakdown of a relationship mm -hmm. because of mystery that is involved. It's a thriller. Pe it's a mystery yeah. thriller, and slowly pieces are revealed, and then it actually, like Inception, leaves you on a cliffhanger. Number four from South Korea, it is The Handmaiden. This is also a movie where different things are revealed in ways you don't necessarily expect. So yeah, The Handmaiden, 2016 director Park Chan-wook. I can say that it's pronounced Park Chan-wook. Oh. Park Chan -wook. I mm. like to be on the record on this because so many people butcher the Korean names. Mm. <laughs> it's fine. And yeah. I am not going forward for my fifth film. I am going to the whitest movie possible. Yay. La La Land. Wes, oh, that's also true. <laughs> <laughs> Wes Anderson's oh. Grand Budapest Hotel. Yeah. It is his eighth feature film, and I think it's his best. It is his most financially successful. Mm. Um, it made uh, almost 200 million at the box office, Whoa. which for Wes Anderson is a huge success. Mm -hmm. Just I got I got to know what's everyone's favorite Wes Anderson film. Very close tie. Oh. I have to put Fantastic Mr. Fox oh, first, just so because good. it's like animated, and and then it would be Royal Tenenbaum. Yeah, like Tenenbaums is like classic, classic. But I also really like Moonrise Kingdom. Mm. <laughs> I thought about it. I'm gonna go with Grand Budapest Hotel. It's fun. It was yeah. it was interesting watching Bottle Rocket for the first time because he didn't oh, have that yeah. framing aspect yeah. in in his film. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. By far, it, my favorite is Rushmore, and it might oh, just God, be because Rushmore. <laughs> that one's a classic, classic. Okay, cool. Jasmine, you want to go next? Sure. I'm gonna start at the bottom. The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Ooh. Oh wow! It was just such a like poetic film. Whose Streets by oh. Sabah Fulayan. It's a documentary that I saw at Rooftop Films, and it mm -hmm. discusses Ferguson from the perspective of individuals who were involved in the protests and leading the protests. And then number two is another documentary, Minding the Gap by Lulu. And I just watched it again two nights ago. And I still loved it. Um, that is on my list of movies that made me cry. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The story develops on its own in such a easy way and is complex so my siblings the people who I was introducing it to they kept they were like oh what's it about is it about skateboarding and I was like no it's about <laughs> so much more than just skateboarding and I think that's what I but mean but it does like, make you appreciate skateboarding oh too. absolutely yeah. absolutely which like that's done very like seamlessly by mm. by Bing Lu it's giving the people opportunities you normally don't people who come from uh, poor backgrounds or whatever, um, who feel like outcasts, giving them the opportunity to also express themselves and not just having upper class people tell the story for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's just beautiful in so many ways. Going back to like skateboarding, have you ever heard the song Kick Push by? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. <laughs> wow, that was like when Luba Fiasco was first coming out. Yeah. If you want to know what the skateboarding feels like in Minding the Gap, just listen to Kick Push by Luba Fiasco and you'll have it. When I first heard the song, I misunderstood the title and I thought it was Kate Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yo, there's a rapper out there who's like really into Kate Bush. <laughs> and then my last film um, is Parasite mm -hmm. by Pong Juno. Pong Juno. Pong Juno. Pong Juno. Another story about class it's done with twists and turns and uh, i cannot wait to see parasite a second time i've only seen it the once and i want to mm. see it immediately again I, I what do you think that film is saying jasmine i know it's very subtle so. <laughs> i mean it's saying the society that we live in there will always be people on the bottom and people on the top oppressing them it's very relevant regarding today's time not even just in the u.s but all over the world. Mm. I love that it's a Korean film. Um, and I love the structure of it too. Like it, it seems like this 
structure that you're like, oh yeah, I got a handle on this. Like, oh, okay. Like that's surprising, but it totally works. And then it just completely busted out of the box. All right. Yeah, I'll go next. The first one is another tough subject. Well, I'll just say it's leaving Neverland. And um, Mm -hmm. uh, it is so powerful. Some people refuse to watch it because they know what it's going to say. And other people refuse to believe it because they don't, they don't want to believe that there are likable monsters that live with us. And it is very complex. It is very thorough. And if you don't know, it is about two grown-ups who were sexually abused by Michael Jackson when they were younger. And I think it is an incredibly important story that, that shows not just what happened, but how parents should be aware. You don't know who people are just because you see them on television you realize it's also just like mining the gap. It's something that people don't talk about. They can't talk about. Certain people just aren't believed. Mm -hmm. And this covers that better than anything that I've ever Mm -hmm. seen. Besides possibly my next pick is a stand-up special. I think it is amazing. It is Hannah Gatsby's Nanette. Again, it's just somebody has something built up in them that they have been thinking about that has been gnawing at them that happened to them when they were a kid and has continued to happen to them. And The most amazing thing I think with movies is that it can be a million people working on it or it can just be one person on stage. This one also is controversial because it is part of a series. It is about love and that is it. It is romantic story for the future. It is from Black Mirror and it is called Hang the DJ. I like Hang the DJ a lot. (laughs) It makes you want to fall in love again and it makes you believe in people and I think that's (sighs) wonderful. So, <laughs> yeah. And then um, the next one is a seven hour film. <laughs> and we thought each intermission the film was going to be done, but it was not. And oh, that wow. was um, OJ, Made in America. <laughs> and the cool thing was Ezra Edelman was there mm. um, at Metrograph. Uh, here in the city to talk about it afterwards. It's like a portrait of everything that's happened since the civil rights movement, like gave us all these gains. And yet we see how many failures there still are, right? Yeah. And then the last one that I watched Home Alone in my bed by Abba DuVernay is 13th. I mean, the amazing thing is the people that she put together and how clearly she lines out the history of uh, the way uh, laws were organized for black people to be oppressed in the United States. And um, I think it is something that they should show in schools. There's nothing so succinct and so direct and so comprehensive as the people that she compiled and the way that she structured this 70 minutes of talking to understand that problem. Those are my five picks. A lot of docs. I think this was the decade for docs. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, so number five, actually, I picked The Look of Silence, which is the it. companion to the act of killing. Ah. And I really debated about whether to put the act of killing, but I don't find it enjoyable to watch the act of killing, whereas I feel very emotionally invested in the look of silence. You know, it's it takes a lot of balls to like show the perspective of the of the perpetrators, but I would rather not be in that mind space. So like the look of silence is more about like the people who have survived, who like carry on the the memories of the people who didn't get to live through all that violence. And so like for me, it's an easier watch and also like very moving to watch. So that's why I picked that one. And obviously the two together are like truly like the apex of what documentary filmmaking can be. And such a retrospective on genocide when genocide isn't accounted for like it was in World War II. Yeah, so then the other one I picked, Burning, there's a lot of like simmering rage and it's like a mystery that doesn't quite have an answer at the end. Also about class and the wealth gap can lead to a sort of rage and how does it manifest itself and what do the rich get away with and all that good stuff and it looks amazing and the score is great Mm -hmm. and so like i thought it was like the masterpiece (laughs) of masterpieces in Mm -hmm. korean cinema 
Shout out to all the Korean movies that were <laughs> so amazing. And like, what a decade. It's cool to see that Americans have gotten hip to it. And there's some venue for more different kinds of narratives, right? So that's cool. I think after that, I would pick Moonlight. When you kind of told us to think about this past decade, one of the things that came up for me was, oh, like, queer folks stop dying in, in films. If you were, like, a queer-identified character, you had to be punished, quote-unquote punished, by dying at the end. And the fact that he's, like, really black and queer and, like, we just don't see enough stories like that anyway. And then a completely different tone of movie, I chose Mad Max Fury Road. Because it was just falls out out of control. (laughs) Keep the patriarchy down. (laughs) Which is how I usually watch movies. <laughs> no, um, uh, probably, I don't, I struggled with whether Mad Max Fury Road was like the favorite or Phantom Thread. Ooh. It's Paul Thomas Anderson probably like firing on all cylinders and like Johnny Greenwood, like he's done great work. Uh, it's ama- I mean, yeah. the soundtrack, it kills it. That score is so beautiful. Yeah. I thought about what movies brought me a lot of joy and like made me feel things the deepest. And so that's the one that really hit. So our vote on favorite films of the decade are Minding the Gap for the feature film and World of Tomorrow for our short. That is our feature and a short best of the decade. Minding the Gap by Bing Liu and World of Tomorrow by Don Hertzfeld. Please take the time to watch them. At the moment, Minding the Gap is included with a Hulu subscription and World of Tomorrow is available for purchase and rent on Don Hertzfeld's Vimeo page. Before we get our way to the Fresh Air Award that chooses the film that advanced the art form forward the most going into the 2020 decade. So this is the most impactful with new ideas found in cinema for the entire decade. Um... That is our Fresh Air Award. But first, let's look back at what the decade was and look forward to what the future may be with two questions to our panel. What do you guys think has changed in the art form of movie making in the last decade? And is there a difference between what has changed between shorts and features? One of the biggest things for me is the perspectives that we've been introduced to in the past decade from more women being involved in storytelling to people of color to minority groups kind of like come to the forefront. I definitely thought a lot about like how the distribution models have changed and also the democratization of who is making this art, partly because things like iPhones and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like cameras on phones are like a thing now. And like, you know, we all picked pretty standard shorts, but like if you asked your average 15 year old like what's your favorite short they probably would have picked something from like tiktok or something like you know like Mm -hmm. and even like the aspect ratio has changed a little Mm -hmm. bit because of those things like oh this is gonna look good on instagram Mm -hmm. or snapchat Mm -hmm. like to me i think obviously the rise of the streaming services is the big change in the industry and tech companies joining funding films brought a dollar amount that we've never seen before It also gave access to foreign film. And most people would only watch documentaries on television, which was highly regulated. So now you get to see, you know, different kinds of docs that are more story driven, that are fun instead of just front lines, uh, which is all I knew when I was growing up. So, yeah, those are the two main things that I think just just have um, really changed things since the 2000s. The one thing that I really appreciate about all of these streaming services is that the, they have been able to hire these auteurs and actually let them do their thing. Like the Coen brothers did a, an anthology film that was heavily seen by a lot of people. I remember I went back for Christmas last year and I had a spirited conversation with my father and my brother about which segments we loved or hated in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. And that's not something that would have happened mm-hmm. 10 years ago. How do you think that actually changed how they made films? What do you think about those films when, when they get free reign? Well, look at last year, Roma. It's not a story that would have been told if he didn't get that money from Netflix. No one's going to give him a, a boatload of money to make a black and white 
movie in Spanish for American distribution like that. It's true. It happened to our boss, who is an auteur and has been doing it for a long time, but somebody who we, um, three of us, work with, that, um, I mean, he got to make Cuban a cameraman, which he's been pitching for such a long time, and now he's, um, John Alpert. Uh, was able to make it uh, during this decade, which I think is interesting. And that might attest to, like, growth in just storytelling. Okay, so then the next thing, what do you hope for in the next decade for cinema? The one thing that I really hope for is as home theaters become better and better, I don't want the cinema experience to fully die. Yeah. I think it serves why, it. I don't understand why people think it's going to die. It's expensive. <clears throat> it is expensive. Yeah. And for the average person, they will enjoy watching Marriage Story more at home mm-hmm. versus watching it in theater. And the average viewer mm. wants the convenience of their home. My family has kids. They like to be able to pause and stop things or like mm-hmm. not have to worry about. But TV didn't and kill And not have to buy bathroom. snacks for all the yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Paying for a family of six <laughs> to go to the cinema costs $100. It's still cheaper than going to a play because it's reproduced. You don't have to pay the actors every time to show up. Yes, costs are rising, but that didn't stop people from going to an event where they can watch it with other mm-hmm. people. I mean, film festivals don't seem to be dying. I think people but that's, are also isolating themselves. That's right? also why I think the superhero genre, the Star Wars, those are actually far more important to keep cinema alive mm. than we actually want to admit. Mm. People, Marvel is hiring. Go the Marvel is hiring the Natalie Portmans, those Brie Larsons. And for directors, mm. for upcoming films, they actually, that's DC, but they hired DuVernay. Um, they hired Destin Daniel Creighton, the director of Short Term 12. Mm. They're hiring these people who have, you know, interesting stories to tell because they want to make these blockbuster <laughs> movies but also keep them interesting so that, sim- that movie theaters can stay alive and I think that's very, very important. Mm. Yeah. I kind of just want that breaking point of like depending on franchises, mm. on mega franchises. They're monopolizing all the theaters. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that we've reached that point where we can just keep making a little more room for the more fringe stuff. Yeah, I think the one thing that I really am looking forward to changing um, is the elimination of thinking how long a story should be or can be. So I think with streaming services and different things that we have, I think you're going to see a rise in short films, a rise in, I keep saying OJ Made in America, but there are other longer series. Chernobyl. Chernobyl and uh, Game of Thrones, which is... 60 hour movie or whatever, mm-hmm. which you've never really seen before. Something that was you know, thought out as a story from the beginning to end, and then they created it with a, high, with a big budget value. And so I think a lot of the, the you know, you have the comic book and these other, these other kind of stories, but you have Big Little Lies and you have- Watchmen, I haven't watched it, but apparently people love Watchmen. Mm. Yeah, and that's sort of a combination of everything. Barack Obama loved it. He did. He thought it was as good as a movie. <laughs> Let's get straight to our Fresh Air Award nominees, the films that pushed movie making forward as an art form the most in the decade of the 2010s. I'll start with my first pick. So I'll start. What up? This film combined like music videos and experimental narrative mixed with animation. It sort of has so many genres with a surprise ending that could be considered less than happy, as we were mentioning. <laughs> That's what really sold it for me. It's, it's going in and out of different worlds. I'll go next since we kind of just talked about this subject. I, for one of these five movies, selected Kick-Ass because it was kind of the canary in the coal mine about mm. the decade of superhero movies. It was back in 2010, off the heels of The Dark Knight. It had the big star, it had Nicolas Cage, and it was a huge financial success, and it was not a new brand it was not a new franchise Mm -hmm. they tried it was just Mm -hmm. um comedy slash action movie and it really kind of kicked off the decade in a a way that was uh, emblematic of how it would play out one of the standouts for me was beasts of the southern wild i watched it last week with the whole family and everybody was just jogging on the floor Mm -hmm. afterward yeah and speaking to this idea of original storytelling and like utilizing people who are not big name actors like there are people in this film who are not actors at all who completely steal the story. Um, and then also along my vein of like 
black storytelling and from a different perspective it, it just hits all of those notes with me and like I it's the first film I ever cried at when I saw it and it's just a really beautiful like visually beautiful story like I really liked it and I thought like the performance by Kuvenjane Wale uh Wallace. Wallace. Wallace, yeah. Yeah, like she, she's incredible. You have an Asgar Farhadi directed film on your list. Which one is that? I thought A Separation has a perfect script. I really like Fireworks Wednesday and I really like About Ellie, but it's just people living their lives. Um, and yet this is a thriller. There's like so much going on. And like every time something is revealed, we were like, oh, this drastically changes how I was perceiving things. So the next one is by one of the most well-known artists of our time. It is Exit for the Gift Shop. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful exploration of the art form uh, in total. And it's made by Banksy, if I didn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm going to go with the movie we already talked about, uh, Hannah Gatsby's Nanette. Mm -hmm. Um, This... As a stand-up comedy, it's as much a TED Talk as it is a, a comedy special. I agree. And I just think it's a, an incredible, incredible piece of footage, if you don't want to call it a feature film. <laughs> I Am Not Your Negro <laughs> okay. is um, a really standout doc for me. Um, one, I learned a shit ton about like the civil rights and the individuals within the movement that it, like just concepts that I hadn't thought of before. And I learned about James Baldwin's work and it was like a poetic piece and it was all archival footage. And I watched that movie because it was Oscar nom- mm-hmm. nominated, mm-hmm. but it was nominated along with 13 and OJ and OJ. Yeah. And I think for me, the reason I put it on this list in terms of the, like what pushed the genre forward Mm -hmm. is because of the use of like archival and the use of James Baldwin's work in it. Um, And people still think that we're improving day to day. And then you see so many things. Yeah. It really outlines Just reflective of, Mm -hmm. yeah, where we come. Elizabeth, then for your next pick, it's a full film, but it's also a bunch of music videos strung together. It's really a visual concept album by Beyonce called The Lemonade. Like, Beyonce is not for everybody, and the music is not for everybody. But she is for most people, I think. I mean, are you into her? Are you into her? Well, I actually, and I want you to finish before. I love the visuals. I think something that bothered me about this visual album is that I felt it, like, the lyrics did not fit for the the storytelling for me. I was like, what is the point? Like, I thought it was more of an experimental because, I mean, it kind of told us through line, but... You get it, it was mostly like through the lyrics. For me. <clears throat> it was thematic, yeah. yeah. And like the I like I loved the story. I just yeah. didn't think that it like the music yeah. didn't support it for me. Like they were they were two separate die, entities die. for me. Yeah. And I found that frustrating. Like it was like, oh, you're putting all of this interesting storytelling together just mm-hmm. so people will like listen yeah. to your music is how it felt for me. For me, I really appreciated the poetry stuff from I think her name is Warshin Shire. Mm. Just threads the whole thing together really nicely. I I love the colors in it too. I think that's yeah it's fun and it changes because they walk through the different spaces or they get to the different spaces they change the color palette constantly where but it still flows well okay so the next one is my favorite new director that i discovered this decade yorgos lanthimos the lobster it's funny and dark the emotions are believable the color scheme is chosen really well and it adds to the film the effects are, are not overdone and the story stays within a spot that is believable. I am glad that Colin Farrell found his second career as Yogros Lanthimos' yeah. muse. <laughs> um, he was great in both The Lobster and Killing of a Sacred Deer. Yorgos has a way of writing and directing this weird, unique line delivery that just is completely otherworldly. That is Well, that reminds me of Lynch, where they're sort of saying lines with a weird emotion that you can't detect what they're feeling, but it seems to have emotion there. Mm-hmm. I, f- I feel like that's the same vein that your ghost hits and maybe took notes from Lynch to, to get to that. It's the same thing John Waters does in Pink Flamingos and 
a lot of his films where it doesn't feel natural. Write the line. I think it's wild that he, after that, after Killing of a Sacred Deer, then went on to make a prestige picture about Queen Anne. And it, mm. everyone just loved it. I loved it. Actually, that's one of these new genre movies where it's like, uh, where it's oh, yeah. historical, but yet done in a farcical manner yeah. where you're not supposed to take it seriously. But I'm a huge, <coughs> I'm a huge Yorgos fan as well. Yeah. I am going to jump to, I'll jump to my short. The music video that I think was the most culturally permeating that I remember of the last decade. Childish Gambino's This Is America. I don't typically actually watch music videos, but this is just one that everyone was watching and talking about. It was sparking conversations on the morning news shows, and it just was uh, about important topics. Uh, I like it more each time that I watch it, which is fun with a short film because you can do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. Now I want to mention the director of the music video, mm -hmm. Hiro Murai. And actually, he's mm -hmm. a collaborator with Dan, with Glover. Mm -hmm. He's done most of the episodes in Atlanta. The next one that is also an animation, Over the Garden Wall. It's about life and death. The amazing thing about it is, just like The World of Tomorrow, it's an adult theme wrapped up in animation. The two main characters are kids, and it can communicate strong themes with, with children, mm -hmm. just like Inside Out and The World of Tomorrow. Very rewatchable. It's funny, but... Um, deals with emotions around a serious subject. I'm really getting to what I think pushed film the most, Get Out. Jordan Peele really came knowing exactly what he wanted to say and this was how he was gonna say it and such a ripple effect even in the sense of like, it's changed our language. People say, oh, he's in the... Sunken place. In the sunken place. <clears throat> Never before have Cheerios been scarier. <laughs> <laughs> right? Being in the movie theater was like such a wild oh, experience. Yes, that's that was, what I was going to say. There's that, somebody goes in the closet and somebody shouts in the theater, don't go in the closet! <laughs> <laughs> um, that was so great. And you know, like, it's not about slavery. It's not about oh, God. a black maid working in a white household, right? Like, it's an original story. I do, I do think, like, Peel is kind of passing it forward. And I think too. it helps with, like, other it's... companies, like A24. They're doing yeah. the same kind of thing with different stories. But they use the genre that has been around for so long that has really said so little, and it has such a huge following. But I think it hits home so profoundly because... He is yeah. at the center of the black experience, and he's somebody who just loves horror mm -hmm. films. That's really cool. The next film on my list is The Act of Killing. It's bringing a unique storytelling to a doc. Mm -hmm. That reshaped what documentary could be for me, especially because it was from this perspective of the perpetrator mm -hmm. and like... Having somebody act that out is... Yeah. Them being willing to it's do it. I mean, it's just like... Like, like what? I mean, to, a direct correlation is like watching Trump admit to everything that he's doing. <laughs> right, right. Right, 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 right. And because there are no consequences. Yeah, right? they don't think there are any consequences. Right. They don't think that there, anything they're doing is wrong. Well, and look at, like, look at where they are now. They, like, they're in a place where they can act that out and they're mm -hmm. still just living their lives. And, and it's the filmmakers that have to hide their identities. Yeah, instead. and I think we see a prevalence of that today still where it's like, well, why haven't we heard about this smaller island nation or about... Currently today, why aren't we hearing about the, the Uyghurs? Yeah, yeah. The, in China. In yes, China. yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So these these stories that, you know, mm -hmm. are about minority populations that are not being told and mm -hmm. they're as important and terrifying as anything that Western cultures are going through. The act of killing is so bold and it takes so many chances. And, and going through that, I think the most interesting thing that he did with the storytelling there is he doesn't go through um, chronologically what they're telling the story about that's not arc of what you see no it's the arc of how they're expressing it now that's what people haven't seen before i'm going to do something <laughs> much more lighthearted. <laughs> it is one cut of the dead it's a horror film that was horror comedy film mm -hmm. that was made for a budget of about twenty five thousand dollars it was a, a passion project, of course, for, yeah. for something produced with that little of a budget. And then it just grew because it premiered at the film festival specifically for Asian cinema mm -hmm. in Italy. It was extremely well marketed. They had promotions where you you come to the premiere or you come to the showing dressed in a zombie. So Aww. it's a combination of 
huge passion, great marketing, and just uh, a great product. And it was a film that sparked new life into a genre that's been s- dead for a while. And you said that it was very interesting um, how it came to the U.S. as well, right? It is interesting how it came to the U.S. It, it got a lot of buzz in the United States because it was accidentally released on Amazon Prime one weekend. <gasps> It was supposed to be distributed in other countries on Amazon Prime, but it was accidentally released in the United States, Hmm. and people noticed it and watched it, and then it suddenly was gone, which increased the buzz for the film. It's very creative in how it was produced and um, (laughs) in the way the story is told. It's very gentle and, like, good old fun. Your next pick? The very top of what I think was pushing cinema is... Under the Skin. Mm-hmm. It's the Jonathan Glazer film starring my favorite <laughs> Asian American actress, Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> it is one of Scarlett Johansson's like best roles, I think. She's playing this alien who was sent to Earth on a mission, which is rather nefarious, you come to learn. And visually it's like fascinating. And like she's having conversations with random dudes, some of them are actors but some of them didn't even know that they were in the movie and then the other thing that's really fascinating is that like get out it's had an effect on popular culture because it was quoted in stranger things all cinematographers that i know kept talking about it because they they love the style and it's very beautiful and there's such unique visual effects with it it's a very cold movie like this is an alien who doesn't understand humanity And it takes her very long to get to that point where like, oh, I kind of see why humans are the way they are. And she like starts connecting with them. Oh, right. That scene on the beach. That's a child in peril in that movie. Um, (laughs) It's a very upsetting scene. I saw it in the movie theaters and I was like, I kind of want to walk out on this scene because it was very upsetting. On a narrative level, it's not easy, but I think it's very fascinating and also like visually I think it's really had an impact already, and I think it will continue to have an impact if people don't forget about it. So, yeah. My last one is The Artist. Mm, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I thought that the fact that this was black and white, like mostly no talking film, um, set in the past, and mm. I think that's cool. Maybe award shows are not always indicative of the general population, but it fucking smashed it's an original piece the legacy of it hasn't been that strong like i feel like i hear so many people shitting on it as like oh one of the weaker oscar winning movies but like a lot of people said it was pretentious i find it really charming and i love berenice bejo in it like it's just like one of the highest quality silent films that was ever made so I think this really kicked off the decade in a grand, grand way, and it is Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan. Yeah. You th- do you consider that a horror? I do consider it a horror. I think it's a psychological horror because of the thing that she's going through. It's the, oh, her mother's terrible. The pursuit of perfection oh. and um, just the way it dements her. I never liked horror up until I saw Black Swan. I hated oh. horror because it was the Freddy Kruegers and it was the Saws and it was... That's what I don't like. And yeah. yeah. So I think this was a very, very good decade for horror, for serious horror that has stuff to say, as opposed to the decade before it, which was oh. paranormal activity. Yeah, and then there oh. was so many I other. I was going to say torture porn, but. Torture yeah. porn, hostile, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Saw. That was yeah. the decade of Saw. Saw. Yeah. It was really the decade of Saw. There were a Saw. lot of installments of Saw. And now you get the reinsurgence, I think, in the later part of the decade, too, because it didn't really happen as. As early, because mm-hmm. if, if th- you think hereditary, you think mm-hmm. the well, the lighthouse I haven't seen, but the uh, witch, the, the, the witch, witch. <laughs> the, the witch. <laughs> yeah. But I think this turned horror into a genre that can be access- accessible for uh, mm-hmm. people that aren't looking for that sort sort of film. It is always important for film. I mean, unless it's experimental, which is you know exploring style or whatever. But it's it does story first. Mm-hmm. Any scares or anything mm-hmm. are later, and it's like a Mm. romantic comedies that can be good and you get when harry met sally Mm. you get love actually you get la la land yes (laughs) now that we have all our nominations for the fresh air award let's tally our votes and narrow it down to one film from each of our nominations let's start with jasmine's nominations the number two pick was 
beasts of the southern wild. And I would say, after watching that this last week, it was the best discovery that I had, and I thought that they should have won the Fresh Air Award. So now I'm a little sad, but um, I guess we'll move on. But number one is also an amazing film that deserves uh, more recognition, and it goes with the theme of documentaries being more important. I could easily argue that this documentary pushed it forward more than any other documentary this decade, and that is The Act of Killing. Nice. For Elizabeth's films, let me do some math here. Okay, the number one is an obvious, obvious winner. I think it's no surprise, and you guys can probably guess already what that is. Number two, however, despite not everyone having seen it, was Under the Skin. It might be the most unconventional of all the movies on this list. It is unique, and it does tell a complete story with virtually no dialogue, and in a totally different way that the artist did, which I think is um, very interesting. Okay, so the, the winner for uh, Elizabeth's choices by far, mm -hmm. and um, it actually got tied for the best vote out of anything with another film, and it was nominated twice. Um, it is Get Out. Yeah. <laughs> so for Thomas's pick, number two was actually Nanette, the stand-up comedy special by Hannah Gadsby. Uh, the number one was One Cut of the Dead. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I mean, that movie is, it's so cool and it's so self-reflective and, um, I was surprised too. I was like, oh, this is cool. But in the end, you're just like, wow, that is such a complete thought. And you're still curious about how they made the film. I mean, you just want to ask them so many questions about the writing process. Okay, now going to the end. The number two, I think it only got number two because people already voted for it. Mm. But it was Get Out, uh, which had uh, by far beat the other films, except for Banksy's Exit Through the Gift Shop. What I always wondered is how do we know Banksy made it? That's, that's what I think about more and more other than it, w considering who the character is of this um, quote unquote documentary film. But I still wonder like, how do we know Banksy made it? I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> okay, so we'll go away for a little bit. Uh, here's some interlude by Sun Nectar. And um, uh, we will vote on our top four films. So you guys, there is a winner, and um, one thing that um, I didn't notice, uh, but as we mentioned, the things that seem to pop up in the 2010s, a lot of our horror films and documentaries have really risen to prominence. And so our final four films are two horror films and two documentaries. So the four films that push movie making the most, place number four, was what it is, Exit Through the Gift Shop took last place and maybe you guys convinced me that um it is less of a documentary than i had anticipated yeah. it's still an amazing movie and i'm happy it made this list the third favorite for the fresh air award third place bronze medal would be one cut of the dead uh coming from japan so we have two films left between jordan peele's debut get out and joshua oppenheimer's debut the act of killing one horror eliminated, one documentary eliminated. Here we are, second place. We won't say, so we will say the winner instead. And the winner of the Fresh Air Award is Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing. <laughs> So thank you so much for listening to Feature in a Short and um, in the forecast to look forward to a short that we are involved in producing uh, called Hermit is Almost Finished. That is directed by Amy Sala. If you want to see Jasmine, Elizabeth, Thomas, 
or my lists, please find us on Letterboxd. We will provide the links in our description of the episode on our website, 41films.com. Follow us on social media at F O. U R W I N D F I L M S. I would like to thank everybody who helps us with the podcast. That includes our sound mixer, Brian Trahan. This year's theme song was by Salitris Ryden Rainbow. And also thank you to Jenny Romer and Cisco Bradley, who hosted us at New Revolution Arts, Dakota Hall, who hosted us in Minneapolis, and uh, Downtown Community Television Firehouse, also known as DCTV in Chinatown in Manhattan. We'd like to thank Thomas Kelsey and Laura Davi for helping prepare food and all the events, the live events, all year long, and Daria Huxley for the photos, and all of the attendees of the live events, and, of course, our presenters. So next year, we will have 10 more episodes, so stay tuned, and otherwise, hope you're enjoying the new year. Bye.